Welcome back to This Week in No Code. I'm your host, JJ Engler. Here are my co-host, David Pal, and we have another delightful show for you this week in No Code. Mm -hmm. We didn't have much news, so we're going to get straight into the story of the day, which is how David built his last business, ads on top from when he was in college all the way till when was it when would, when did you exit end of 21 end and of it was what five year journey was it a six year journey seven six and a half six and a half with the time i stayed there yeah and all the up and downs with it ending in a multi-million dollar exit but mm -hmm. first david you tweeted this week about bootstrapping and if you used millions of your own dollars if it's still considered bootstrapping so my question to you is were you talking about yourself, David? <laughs> no, 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 no. No, <laughs> okay. no it's, you know, it's, it's an interesting, uh, I found the, the, the hypothesis weird because, you know, lots of people like adding the trademark bootstrap, like the, the comment, like, hey, I'm a bootstrapped entrepreneur. I'm bootstrapping this company, which usually means they're using no money. Yeah. Like, basically nothing i'm putting no money in maybe some like less than a hundred thousand dollars kind of thing yeah 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 yeah. and so you know when i see and i don't know what peaked this question but i saw someone who i know has done very well talk about bootstrapping a company i'm thinking about like well does that is, is that really the same like is it fair like and if it is the same which it, it kind of is right like you're not using someone else's money. You're pulling yourself up by your own bootstraps. This is money you earned your way and use that to build on, like compound these problems or the, yeah. this, this investment. But it's something for the average indie hacker to realize that if you want to say you're bootstrapped, that's great. It's harder than yeah. if you had money to spend on things. Not always. I mean, it depends on what you're doing. Um, but, you know, comparing yourself to the founder who's bootstrapping to, you know, a hundred million dollars, but has already had a $50 million exit. Maybe it was, I think it was, um, I forget his name, the guy from a smart bear from WP engine. Um, oh, I don't know. He okay. had an exit. They were basically building like an early version of GitHub and then built this WordPress hosting platform. WP Engine is like this conglomerate or amalgamation of amalgamation of hosting and plugins and more stuff for the WordPress ecosystem. And it's like, yeah. you know, a unicorn basically. And he bootstrapped it. It is, I guess, where I, what I had read. Maybe it was wrong. I, I don't know if I, I haven't validated it. Um, but he had already had a many million dollar exit and I'm sure he had put money in. And so it kind of what he makes you wonder like, well, yeah. yeah, my bootstrap experience would be different if I already had millions of dollars to yeah, throw. It's like a self seed. It's like you seeded yourself. Yeah. Like my... your, your family office was the investor. Right. 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 And so it's a little bit different. And I think, you know, chasing the bootstrapped mentality is, um, is is a worthy fight right yeah. i don't i don't think every business needs venture capital and Especially if you uh, yeah and if you start at the end right with what you want which is for most people an exit most of the indie hackers are really just trying to build to sell if they're trying to sell then venture capital closes the door on a lot of exits right like you go raise a billion or sorry yeah, if you raise a billion dollars, or probably your name starts with S and ends with Am Altman. Uh, <laughs> if, uh, if you raise a million bucks, right, they're going to want a $10 million exit. If you raise 2 million bucks, they're going to want 25 to 50. Yeah. The number and of you companies. Can, like, you... you could right away de qualify so many business ideas based on do you want to raise VC? All right, your business idea, can it get to 10 million? Can it get to 100 million? No, yeah. then you're probably not a VC you know, ready company. Yeah, 
And, and that's an interesting problem, right? Like, right, this company I'm building right now, it probably isn't going to be, I mean, I can say almost certainty with the product we have today, if we yeah. don't add more products, we are not going to be able to sell for more than $50 million. Probably if everything goes right. Yeah. Right. If like we capture a hundred percent of the market. Yeah. $50 million seems like a bit of a stretch. Yeah. Like a lot of a stretch. And so Which that might be good for some smaller offices and smaller investment. Oh, I'll, I'll throw in a hundred grand kind of thing, but you won't be able to really raise a ton of money with that potential outcome. Yeah. If I go to, I, you know, most institutional venture capitalists are like, no, I'm, you know, if I can't return my fund, I'm not investing, right? Lots of the time, that's what happens. Now, you know, raising a hundred grand or 200 grand at a couple million dollars and selling for 10 means that, you know, everyone still gets 5X their money. Yeah. Which is not bad, right? In the next five years, if you can 5X your money, you beat the market, like, congrats. That's fantastic. Yeah. But, but there's the a lot of risk associated industry, with that. Yeah. And, and you gotta, you know, you'd have to be upfront with them and the number of people you have, the types of people who invest are not their angel investors and maybe closer friends than, than anything else. And in fact, we've had about five, maybe, maybe a few more people who said, when you raise your round, let me know I'm in, which is fantastic. But the caveat of, great, I'm happy to go raise 250 and use that money to build this product. Sure. I'd, you know, for 10% of the company, 20% of the company, I hope we can get you five extra money back. Yeah. Right. Um, and if that's an outcome, that's okay. Then like, great. Yeah. But there's, there's so much that comes with raising money. You know, like yeah. when I first started off, raising money was like the goal, you know? Um, and it, yeah. it, it that's kind of what I was thought to believe almost of like following the VC uh, philosophies and like, oh, you build an idea, you raise, you raise, you raise, and you raise a new round that's successful. That's awesome. But in so many ways, like now that I've learned what we could build and how to bootstrap and all that kind of stuff, it's almost like raising is not my first choice. It's almost like a last choice. And it's almost like, I, well, there's some ideas you just have to. So it's like when you start that idea, it's like, this is an idea where you just kind of have to raise because that's part of it and how we're going to actually make it big. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess you just, when you come up with the idea and you validate it and you, you research the market, you kind of have to decide then it's like, are we going after this route? Because if so, we're going to need to raise a lot of money. Otherwise, you know, the way I see it personally is I, I just, I don't want to start something where I have to raise money because then I have so much more obligations. There's so much more risk. There's so much more on my shoulders of, getting this return on investment and it creates this kind of different trajectory of growth, 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 growth. You need to always hit your growth. And if you don't hit your growth for a quarter or two, what's going on, all this kind of stuff, rather than going a little bit slower, taking your time, having more fun and really kind of trying to build this thing up at your own speed. Yeah. But I guess the, the, the question that, that I, the counter question to that is if the likelihood of success is almost the same, no matter what you start, almost zero, <laughs> right? Like every business almost gets, there's almost no chance you get to an exit, right? There's just so much shit in the way. Why not swing for the fence? Well, my answer is I just, if I knew that, if you were to ask me that question, I would say, absolutely, I'm not raising money then. Because in that case, I don't want to let all those people down. And I don't want to have all that crazy pressure and yeah, the yeah, yeah. Down associated with it. If I knew I was going to fail in the beginning, I would just rather do my own thing, give it everything I got. And if I failed, it was just on me and I could lick my chops and move on. But, okay. So you're going to, if you are starting a company yep. and you're saying you're built either building a business that hits venture scale, that could be billion dollar plus, or let's say 500 million, right? Just to make it the math even better, 500 million you have to raise, or you could sell for 10 million, right? Like in the realm of confidence, like 99.99% chance of it not happening, not more nines than that, right? You could sell for 10. Yeah. You know, so and the I, exit is life changing. You only have so many, it's going to take five to 10 years, no matter what, right? You're going to spend five years at this thing. The people you're raising- It depends on where from, you're at in your journey. You know, if you tell me that, 
if I build it and I pursue this this idea that, that this market is here and with this game plan, you could build it for five years, exit for 10 million, keep majority of that and have a higher success rate of maybe like, hey, you know, success rate of 40%, <laughs> right? I'm saying the success rate isn't that much different. It's 90, it's a one, per, it's 0.1% versus 0.00001%. So it, it just depends on where zero. you're at in your life. Like I would, I would, I'm much more attracted to that smaller exit at the moment, that $10 million exit that you have, um, you know, get your feet under you, have it your kind of own journey. Don't be racing and having a 300 person team before you know it and, and get that exit, you know, take care of the next 20, 30 years with, you know, five to $10 million. And then during that time, I have nothing to lose. And if I'm ready to really get back in the game, maybe I swing for the fence at that point. But I would rather not risk it all and just do that. I would rather take a more, um, I think, you know, risk-free option. I mean, there's always going to be risk. But not like, risk. Definitely not risk-free. Yeah. It, there is something to be said about getting a win under your belt and a couple million dollars in the bank, a million dollars in the bank, half a million dollars in the bank to then have a little bit of buffer for a exactly. year or two of really not having to think about it before taking the next bet. Right, I next, think the next chance. exactly. I think you're speaking from experience here with your last startup. Right. Right. So, so tell us a little bit about yeah, that startup. So, right? so the last startup um, was a ad tech company. So the the origin of this last company called Ads on Top um, was I was at the end of my PhD in uh, environmental engineering, right? So I, I studied in water treatment, uh, methane production in wetlands at Princeton for four and a half years because Jesus. you know it was interesting. I wanted to be outside. Uh, I was studying, you still want to be outside. I just want to be Nothing's outside. really changed there. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I was studying wetlands. Uh, I was in, I never wanted to go into academia. Like I didn't want to be a professor. I wanted to go like build stuff and help people. Mm -hmm. And um, I, but while I was there, I got involved in their business program. They don't have a business school at Princeton. There are no professional schools, no law school, no medical school, no business school. Um, and the Keller Center was like my first, I guess, lesson in entrepreneurship a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, I had started a nonprofit while I was like my first year at Princeton. Uh, it was a scholarship fund. We actually just closed it down like the other day sent wow. the last bit of money to another charity to run the scholarship for us. Wow. We raised a few hundred thousand dollars uh, to help kids in New Jersey whose families had been affected by cancer. We gave scholarships okay. to those students. Um, we just donated the last like 50 grand to a nonprofit to, to keep running it called the Valerie Fund. Cool. Um, so I was kind of like learning a little bit about business. Uh, but nonprofits are a great way to start the business journey because you still have to do everything you would do in a business, but people are way nicer to talk to you, <laughs> mm -hmm. right? Hey, here's the charity I work on and we're giving scholarships scholarship doing good work. And people are willing to donate where the product is like an event, right? Yeah. Where you're like, oh, we host a gala. Oh, we're running a volleyball tournament. And people are like willing to, you know, friends of mine, like are willing to volunteer because they love me and they love the cause. Right. So it's yeah. a great way to kind of get started. But isn't it hard to like actually become a nonprofit? So like, what is that one article that you need or something like that? I don't know. Yeah. The 501 C three certification yeah. is yeah. Um, a hurdle to actually become a nonprofit. Um, we, I had a friend who was interning at the Senator's office. <laughs> and so he wrote a letter from the like on the senator's letterhead got him his like chief of staff or someone to write a letter to the irs to help push it through because it was the new jersey senator we were helping kids in new jersey um so that that helped uh, okay along. yeah that, it, it i think i think that would year. do it yeah it takes <laughs> about a year to get the, this moving but 
in reality, it is a good hurdle because it forces you to do stuff. Like yeah. there's a check set of check boxes you need to do and policies you need to write. And you have to think through how it's all going to work before you actually get started. And so that was my first entrance into like business, even though it was not for profit. It was fun. We were making money. I was learning everything, Bo help holding board meetings, getting people to do work, delegation, all that stuff, right? Recruiting. Um, and then I got involved uh, with the Keller Center. Um, and I, I was involved with the Human Centered Design Program, which if anyone knows IDEO, you know, they're famous for bringing human centered design, starting with why, starting with the human, trying to build problems for people, not just businesses. Mm -hmm. And so, um, in that process, I met a friend who was a computer science major. We did a hackathon together. We actually built, it was kind of cool. It only half worked because the hardware was janky, but we built this really cool tool that using a live scribe pen, uh, if you wrote on a uh, post-it note and stuck it on a wall with these sensors on it, it would then automatically transform to a digital whiteboard as well. And what was cool is if you pick the, the post-it note off the wall and move it somewhere else, it would also move in the digital whiteboard. So it was this like three-dimensional whiteboard that actually changed... Uh, with how you represent it. So the idea was you could do remote brainstorming okay. where you can actually see what people were doing. And so you uh, could have this like some in-person people writing, sticking things on a wall, and then you could put it over a screen if you wanted, right? And then you could yeah. see what other people are doing too. And then you can kind of just very neat do this whiteboard thing. And so after this, this project, I pitched the, the guy I was working with, um, on building ads on top. And I was like, Hey, I have this idea, you know, this is 2015 Ubers are taking over, right? That this is the time you're still like hopping in an Uber, the front seat at the airport, right? You had mm -hmm. to like pretend you knew the guy, otherwise his car would get detained. <laughs> um, and I was like, Hey, taxis are dying. Uber's taking over. Let's take the ads from the taxi and stick it on the Uber. Like, that's a great idea. You know, of course, these ads, billions of dollars of ads, or many mil hundreds of millions in New York are running on cabs. Well, it's if like they're on dying, top of the cab on top of the cab. Yeah, yeah. Okay. We want it on the top. So we wanted to put yeah. a screen on the roof. Yeah. And geofence everything. Right? Ads on top. Ads on top. Exactly. <laughs> it, was, it was such a literal <laughs> name. Uh, you know, we couldn't say ads on Ubers, ads on Lyft. Those were all trademarks or like ads on top because that's how I would pitch it. Oh, what do you do? Oh, we put ads on top of cars. Like yeah. that's it. Okay. And so we set out to do that, right? That was what we set out to do. Um, and we started as a little project, just kind of hacking away, seeing if we could get the numbers to work out. And we knew nothing about outdoor advertising. Yeah. And when you look at it, you're like, oh yeah, the numbers seem to make sense. And so we tried. And so we actually... The first experiment we, we got was we built an app. Again, this is my first entrance into like real engine, real stuff. But I think the best part is like you started with the numbers. Like you could do, you can validate or not validate so many business ideas from the numbers right there. Like if you just start, instead of putting yeah. together MVP or whatever, it's like, if you go to the numbers and you put the spreadsheet together and say, this is what I want to make. This is what we could sell it for. Is it going to be worth my time? Right. You you could validate it for yourself without even really putting in any effort. Yeah, and it's necessary but not sufficient to make a good idea. Yes, yes. Right, you should do that for sure. Can you make enough money? Um, Harrison and I went through this experience with my newest company as well. Does do yeah. these numbers are these like legitimate? Yeah. Um, and so we started with that. The first idea was actually kind of neat. Um. It was really hacked together. We basically built this mobile app that you could do a download from the app store okay. that had a Bluetooth sensor that we would tuck into the sign. And so we would know if the sign was plugged into the car, if the Bluetooth was responding, and then we'd use the phone to track mileage. 
where was it, how much did it drive, how long was it driving. And it was pretty sweet. Like, we hacked all these pieces together. Like, we bought stuff on Alibaba. We bought, like, the plastic signs to start just to see if we could do it. Yeah. Uh, we hired a driver in Philadelphia because I went to school at Princeton. 40 minutes away is Philly. It was easier to get through than New York. And Philly had, like, easier rules of, like, putting okay. signs in your cars. Um we had a 30 day trial. We had a friend of mine bought an ad. He ran a sunglass company called glass U and he put an ad up for 300 bucks, put an ad on the car or on the roof. And, uh, there were magnets on the, on the bottom, really strong magnets. Yeah. And then we had a cord that plugged into the cigarette lighter to illuminate it. Okay. And we hired a driver, signed a, wrote a contract, signed a contract, met with this guy, stranger, right in Philly. Nice guy. I met him randomly on the side of the road at a Starbucks one time. Gave him the sign, which smelled so horrible. The sign, okay. straight from China, just oh. smelled like fumes. Just like uh, emitting plastic fumes. We, we bought like five or ten of them and stuck them in our sunroom. Like, we couldn't go in the sunroom. It was so bad. Wow. Uh, <laughs> and so, I'm sure he didn't love it. But anyway, so we ran a 30-day test. We're tracking, tracking. Everything's looking great. He's driving. We can see. We have the GPS spots. We see where he's driving. Yeah. And on day 29, I get a phone call in the middle of the day. Hey, David, the sign fell off the car. It's somewhere on the highway. <laughs> <laughs> and it had just like bumped. Like he was driving on this like bumpy part of the road. And it just yeah. bumped off the side and was just swinging on the side of his car and fell off. Uh, and it just rolled onto the side. I think all of the equipment was still like in his car, but it had detached from yeah. the charge. Was his car damaged? Nope, totally fine. Okay. Everything was fine. So it was a magnet. It that. was like it was totally okay. Yeah. Uh the car the sign fell on the side of the road. So yeah. I texted my then girlfriend, now wife, Delaney. Huh. I was like, hey, so I have to go to Philly. You wanna go? And we went hunting for this sign. <laughs> because we didn't want it like rolling down the highway and causing an accident or something. I was yeah. like, this is going to get tied back to us and the advertiser because his, his ad is on the sun. Yeah. yeah. So we went and found it. It had rolled off to the side. It was totally safe. But we right. like stopped in this fast lane of this highway for like a minute to go peck, to go pick up this sign, stuff it in the car and, and spend the day and the rest of the day in Philly. She must have uh, really liked you to risk her life like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Little did she know she'd be yeah. chasing cars all over Los Angeles as well. <laughs> um, and that was like our first experiment. And it seemed, despite that it fell off. It still worked. You got 29 days of tracking. Yeah. Yeah. Like the process needed some refinement, but yeah. it worked. And um, like we're like, oh, better security. It needs like better magnets. Sure. And we need more ads and we wanted it to be digital, right? Yeah. And we didn't want it to be static because we thought that was where the future was. Like the future right. was in that. And, and that allows you to do was. more with the amount of sponsors and just it's so much more flexibility. Yeah. And the logistics of like in the taxi world, all of the taxis go and park in a parking lot at night and they would change all the ads all in one go. Well, Ubers don't do that. Right. Yeah. They're like all over the place. Right. And so we, we didn't want those logistics. Right. So that's where the, the digital really made sense because we could change the ads on the fly. Right. Whatever yeah. we wanted. And, and, and so like the it's whole, month, cool it's, it's last man hours. You don't have to actually yeah. go out and do all that stuff. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. We're like, we're computer scientists. We're not like people. We don't need, yeah. like, we want to solve this problem. And yeah. we figured like, that's the hard thing. If we can solve that, sure. We can dumb it down and do less. Sure. But we can also just do more. Yeah. And so I started on this journey raising some money to, like, we were building uh, through the eLab at Princeton. They gave us some money for the summer interns. We built the targeting platform. Okay. We would use my computer to, to be the car, right? <laughs> like, I could just run it on my computer. And so we would draw a geofence, and I'd walk down the street. And the ad would change. <laughs> and I was like, great, it's working. Like, this yeah. is what we want, right? Yeah. Uh, and so we built this platform for us 
to use. It wasn't meant for like there was a buying side that you could buy your own campaigns, a self serve yeah. component, but it was meant for us the way we wanted to run our network. Yeah. So we were working really hard to get this off the ground, but we needed money. Like we needed to buy hardware. Yeah. And so we I raised like like that. Yeah, we raised a small family and friends around three hundred grand or something. Mm-hmm. between me and friends and family right that's who that's it awesome. was and just like hey yeah. here's what we think we're gonna do yeah and i just remember like the first pitch deck was our finances would be like yeah i mean in five years we'll be making 300 million dollars a year <laughs> duh <laughs> i mean how did you even know like how to raise like what vehicles to use when raising did you use a safe that would like was the safe seed, what was your valuation? Yeah. did you Not have any kind of like this. mentor help you with this there were some folks at the E Lab in Princeton who had some experience with this, uh, but I used a safe note, and like that's okay. kind of what I knew. Yeah, uh, seemed safe and simple. Uh, that was actually what I I did my first round at three hundred thousand on a safe note. Yeah, uh, but I had a, a mentor helping me. I had no idea like any yeah. of this without that mentor, I'd be screwed. Yeah, and so a safe note basically stands for. S- uh, simple agreement for future equity basically okay. means I don't know how much the company is worth right now, but I'm going to take your money. And when I raise again later, cause I'm going to grow yeah. so fast when I raise my series a or seed or whatever the next round would be, we'll be that, that investor is going to help me determine a real price. And I'm just going to give you a discount. Yeah. Or I'm going to say, Hey, you get less, you get a preference. Yeah, like a 25% then, discount or something. Like that. Yeah. Could be a discount. Could be a cap. Hey, you know, the cap is 5 million. If the next round you raise, you're worth 10 million. These investors actually get money at 5 million. Yeah. Right. And so everyone, so you get the benefit of getting in early, but yeah. the, the founder doesn't have to put a price on it. Right. Which is really hard to do early and, stage. and give away shares yet because there is no yeah. price and there's no value in that sense. You don't need to start sending shares and all that kind of stuff. So it's a, it's a yeah. more simple agreement. In fact, you don't even need to create shares yet of your company. Right, exactly. Like it just exactly. makes the legal side also yeah. much easier. Much right. easier. Yeah. So we raised a, a couple hundred grand. Um, but, you know, I sw- I was swinging for the fences. Like I wanted this to be a $300 million company. Mm-hmm. And so we hired a, we thought Los Angeles would actually be a better place to start Um this operation for a couple of reasons but in picking los angeles we actually found a salesperson that used to work for the los angeles times which i thought was perfect like you're selling local newspaper ads you can sell this like this is targeted and dynamic and street level and she was absolutely fantastic she was also really highly regarded at the LA Times. And so we started pursuing the LA Times as our partner. Yeah. Hey, if we put cars on the road, would you sell them for us? Right? Like yeah. we started trying to cut the scope of what we were we were responsible for. We didn't yeah. want to have to do logistics. We didn't want to have to do product development and all of the sales. Yeah. And so we went to the LA Times and we worked our way all the way up. I got meetings and pitches with the president. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> At and what, 22 years old, 23 was, years old? No, I was like 26 or 27. Okay. Are you a yeah. PhD? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So like 27, uh, I remember sitting on the spirit flight on the way out, practicing my pitch. Um, and basically they're like, we love this idea, but before we can commit, we need you to put 10,000 cars on the road. I was like, wow, <laughs> that's a pretty tall order, 10,000 yeah. cars. They're like, yeah, that's that will give us enough scale to sell. And I was like, you couldn't sell 100? He's like, not worth our time. Wow. I was like, well, 10,000 cars, we were looking at screens that were that cost $15,000 each. I was oh, like, man. that's like $100 million. A million dollars. Five. Yeah, that's a lot of money. Yeah. Right? I was like, we can you like guarantee any sales? Give us some money to help. Like, yeah. They're like, no, you do it. We'll we'll try to sell it. I yeah. was like, well, I can't, I can't live on that. Like, you, this has been a waste. Let's get to some other like, and there was just it kind of got to some impasse. 
Yeah. We eventually did find a partner in Santa Monica that had screens already on their rental cars. And that was our hey. first customer. We're like, hey, maybe we can try it out for real using your cars and your ads that you already have on there. Yeah. You know, we'll just give it to you. Like, we'll just make this work. We'll try to sell whatever we can on top of it, but let's just get our software in there. And this is when Delaney and I started chasing cars around Los Angeles because it wasn't working very well. Like, it was really hard. Like, the the hardware that was in the screens was, like, old and janky and had its own weird intricacies. Yeah. And... We had to like go see it live. Like, why was oh, it? Well, happening? actually, she came to LA with you. So you guys moved to LA. Yeah, we moved this. to LA from the East Coast together. I always wondered why you were in LA. So yeah, this yeah. is the this reason. is why. Yeah, this is you why. wanted to chase cars with I LA was, times. I was flying back and forth every couple of weeks, and I was okay. just like, I can't keep doing this. This is crazy. Yeah. There's nothing holding me there. Let me move. Yeah. Did you finish at Princeton? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, okay. So I started the company. I was done with my dissertation. It had been submitted, it defended, but I had fellowship money left and I was like kind of in between things. Um, and yeah, so so I was all done, went to go work on this full time um, after applying to jobs and the jobs were like, we don't care about your PhD. You're just going to follow the rules the EPA set. And I was like, that sucks. Yeah. Um, and so... We moved out and we were trying to troubleshoot these things in the field, which meant driving around and following the car. It's like we had a GPS signal yeah. from the car, so we knew where it was. And so we would just drive alongside it and then it would turn and we'd have to like somehow get back to it. So, and we were pushing live into the, into the field, like, oh, it's still this, it's still flickering. Can you check? And then we'd like push and change and watch the screen reboot. And then do it again. And so many angry calls from customers or from wow. that customer. Why is it not working? We can't sell these ads. Yeah. Um, and we decided like, okay, yeah. Why can't we? We're a startup. You knew this was the risk. We're just going to yeah. keep trying. Um, but at somewhere around that part of the time, we decided to pivot from trying to run our own network to just selling the software. Like okay. it, it had a value for these guys, like, because they couldn't do what they needed with geofencing using yeah. anything else. And so um, we were like, wow, we, could, we should sell this, like, software as a service instead of just for cars, for anything. Like, this could work on any screen. I imagine not moving cars is probably a little easier. Yeah. Right? You don't have to worry about bad Wi Fi and moving things and bumps and, you know, the hardware is easier all these things. And yeah, so we, we ended up pivoting to software, which meant our, the, the cost was way lower, right? And we didn't need to buy a hundred million dollars, which is a joke yeah. of hardware. We just yeah. needed more software. Yeah. More engineers. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, we had a couple of co-founders that were taking equity instead of cash. So our costs were low. Uh, you know, we hired was your wife really a co-founder. People. Was she working with you? No, no, no. She was doing her own thing. Just, uh, just helping you. Yeah. She like, Hey, I'm chasing. You want to chase with me? <laughs> um, yeah. So she, she wasn't involved in the company so much except for that. Um, and then sometime around this moment, we were kind of running out of money. Um, but we had happened. some customers we had sold a bunch of software to truck networks and to actually screens on garbage cans. Hmm. Uh, they were our first cu- couple customers. I was like, there's something here. We just need to like finish. Screens on garbage cans. Yeah. What? yeah. Like in arenas, in oh, like okay. stadiums. Okay. Right? They would run ads for stuff, the brands that were in the stadium. It was a, str- a strange model, I think. Most people don't want their ads on garbage cans, but like. Yeah. In that environment, you want every ad you can, right? To sell. Yeah. And um, we ended up raising another hundred grand from Princeton, 
which was through a entrepreneurship fund that they had. It's Evergreen Fund. It's not actually a program they run anymore. But for new, newly graduated students, you could apply for up to a hundred grand if you had raised a hundred grand elsewhere, um, and they deemed your idea a success. Yeah, like that's awesome. Yeah, and so we did that, got some more money, but at this moment, Amazon, our Amazon credits ran out, and so all of a sudden, our basically free service turned to fifteen thousand, twenty thousand dollars a month. Ugh. We're paying to Amazon and we weren't making that much. We were yeah. making something, but not enough. Yeah. And right around this time, my co-founder and CTO quit. Ugh. And not in like a, hey, I think I'm going to go somewhere else. It's a, hey, David, it's Saturday morning. I'm not coming back on Monday. <laughs> Damn. Like, done. Damn. Done. After, was it two years you guys were doing this together at that point? Uh, maybe three, almost three years. That's he had a, he had taken a job right out of college, so he was kind of okay. working double duty. And then he okay. took time off to do this with everyone who had taken time off to do this full time. Yeah, we actually rented an apartment in uh, Playa Vista. We all worked out of it. Most of them oh, nice. lived there. Most yeah. of the guys lived there. I lived outside and was there every morning before they woke yeah. up. <laughs> um, and he quit like just abruptly. Like yeah. the lease was ending, like things were getting tough because the bills were piling up all of a sudden. Yeah. yeah. And he quit. And then that's when I picked up Bubble. Because I was like, we have a business. Like yeah. we have customers. We have like a real thing here. Yeah. We just need to grow it more. Like we just need to keep going. Yeah. And basically everyone... Shortly after, there were three of us, and then there were two of us, me and one other guy. Damn. And so he was basically maintaining the system so that it would stay up and run, and then started to rebuild it so that we could add more customers and new customers. Okay. While I was learning Bubble and trying to build a product that people needed to rely on, Yeah, as a non-engineer, like, this is 2017, 2018. 2018, I guess, whatever yeah. the year was. Um, and like things weren't stable at Bubble. <laughs> like things were breaking all the time. And it kind of feels the same way now. <laughs> yeah, it feels like that now. Yeah, it does. Yeah. <laughs> These were like very major outages all the time and for a long time. And I don't even know if they had a status page at the moment. It was just like. Yeah, that was like, early. Like yeah. Broken. Uh, but we basically, we lost almost all of our customers. Actually, I think we lost, yeah, almost all of them. But I was just determined to get it done. And... Uh, I mean, it would be so easy for you, for you to quit right now. Yeah. You know, like, it would be yeah. so easy for you to quit. You run out of money, your CTO quit. You yeah. don't, you know, like, you don't know how to build any of this. You lost your customers. All right. Yeah. I I'm think sure any sane friend. person would hang it up right here. Yeah. And that's kind of where your journey now begins. Right. Exactly. <laughs> and this is when I become a bubble guy. Yes. And so like at this moment. And it we, alters the rest of your, you know, yeah, next, know. rest of gener yeah, whatever, rest of my, century, whatever. The next seven years. Yeah. Um, we didn't go at, like we were still going at it really hard. Uh, but it wasn't our only focus at the moment anymore. <clears throat> it was it was my only focus for a while longer. I was still tr I would try tinker on some things. I actually started another product in the middle called Dine In Dash, which was yeah. a QR code ordering and payment system for restaurants. Okay. In 2018, that nobody wanted QR codes. <laughs> what the hell? Yeah. Like you were, you were early. Just early. Early is the same as being wrong. Yeah. Uh, and so we were just early. And then we tried to pivot into like restaurant analytics and marketing. And it, it just, we didn't get any traction early on. And so it didn't work. Yeah. Um, and so I started to pick up Bubble. Eventually got pretty good at Bubble because I was in it every day for yeah. hours and hours, for eight, 10 hours a day. Yeah. Between building and on the forum looking for stuff, I was just 
reading. I was just like learning Pebble. Yeah. And um, that's, we rebuilt it, right? That's basically what happened. We rebuilt it, the whole thing. You, the, the front end, at least. You didn't rebuild all we, the back No, end. we eventually built, well, rebuilt the whole thing. Because not in Bubble, this, though. Not in Bubble. The back, okay. this was all low code. Well, not all. Okay. Code. That's a weird thing to say. It was low code. The front yeah. end was Bubble. Everything the customers touched was Bubble. Um, the back end was all built in code. And okay. in the meantime, while we were transitioning, we were using a lot of Bubble's database and workflow stuff to like help manage things in the middle until sure. the back end caught up, right? Sure. And then eventually we would switch everything to just back end. Makes sense. Um, and so those were it. kind of iterations, right? It okay. was just all code, then Bubble front end and back end, then less bub- less Bubble, more Bubble is just a front end. Yeah. Um. Yeah. So, so you rebuilt so it. Rebuilt it. it. Oh, you got it. COVID hit. This, okay. So we rebuilt it. Started getting some traction, and then COVID hit. This is like now 2020. So this is this, this is when you worst. give up number two. This is this is the you should stop this, David. This is, you, you really should stop it now. Yeah. Uh, COVID hits. The out of home industry is decimated. Like it is just grinds to a halt. Gone because no one's outside. Everyone's yeah. there's no one on the highway. Just there's like no one the in film the stores. industry, it just went away. Yeah, it, it's it, just it, people it, were buying billboards, but like maybe for not as much, right? They were yeah. they were it wasn't as good, right? And so, on one hand, people were not. Some people were just like, "Hey, I I can't pay for anything. Like I can't add any costs. We are making whatever we can." Other yeah. people were like, "Well, we've been looking for a new system." Yeah. So we're going to switch now, right? Like now's our chance, okay. right? Because they can't, right? Yeah, and you were probably cheap. Yeah, we were way cheaper than the alternative. Yeah. Um, and so we. How were you doing your sales? Up. Is it just cold emailing and cold just, calling? Just networking and emails. Um, and we were just like signing any deal we could for whatever yeah. price we could. Yeah. And some customers were awful. Yeah, but we stuck with them because we after l- losing twice, <laughs> you know, just take whatever you can. All my friends were like, "What are you doing?" Yeah, like what the hell? Like, go get a job. You yeah. can go get a job. All my friends were getting like jobs at Google, right? Right. They were right. all like going and being consultants and programmers and you know, nice, nice big salaries. And I was like, I'm gonna struggle for the next forever <laughs> until I make this. Yeah. Um. Wow. And so we were building this. I was teaching Bubble, consulting uh, as well. Uh, but we were like building this thing up again. Yeah. Right? And it was me and my one co-founder who stuck with us. It was just the yeah. two of us. Yeah. And we was were he full-time working. with you? He was working full-time hours, but also going to school to get his master's degree. Okay. And so he was like in school and doing this and i was doing this and bubbling yeah. and like we were you know just trying to make it all work whatever we could yeah. um and we were like at some point the business was good business was growing but i was just exhausted i was just like i need to get out of this like i just can't keep doing this um and we started looking for an exit. Like we found, and we. But, but you got, you grew it to the point of just like, all right, we have enough customers now. We're making enough money where it's actually sellable. Yeah. We, we had some pretty consistent revenue. It was growing. And we had a couple leads on um, big customers, but we couldn't solve their problem as a two person team or yeah. eventually a three person team. We added some, yeah. some more developers. We needed like we needed money, like yeah. to go service the big like. And we were talking to an elevator network that a huge contract. It would have been like fifty grand a month, and we could have gotten it had we had money and support to go get. Gotcha. Um, and so we like we were, had been told actually by this customer, you have the contract, like it's yours. <laughs> Like we will, we've picked you. Hmm. And so at that point we're like, you know, great, but also terrifying. Yeah. And so we, with yeah. It. yeah. So we need to go figure out 
like what were you able to use that to like leverage a higher sale, selling price that kind yeah of i mean it was all part of the deal right everything right hey here's what we've been told this company said hey we would have chosen you this was the gas station network hey we would have chosen you yeah had you been bigger you sell the chance but it seems unlikely yeah um yeah and so we use all of it like hey we're growing these are the opportunities ahead of us like we can go get all of this together and so we engaged with an investment banker actually that's how we found this deal they okay. we chat we were just happened to chat on linkedin through linkedin we got on a call and i said yeah we're you know we're thinking about selling we're you know open to it and they're like well we might have a buyer like we know someone looking for something in this space and so um we started the process of like going through due diligence. We yeah. had gotten other offers as well. We had actually three other offers. Um, not on microacquire. Not uh, none on microacquire. <laughs> we did list it on microacquire, but that okay. isn't where we got them from. Okay. Um, you know, we had just made friends with people. Yeah. And they were like, "Oh, this is interesting. Would you be open to sell?" Yes, actually, we would. Yes. Surprise. Yes. <laughs> Put me out of my misery. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. And so, you know, we had some LOIs signed, we had some, you know, interest, uh, and all of those things put us through the ringer on the M and A process. And we ran a real M and A process, you know, not, and, and not to say micro acquires and, but like a nine month negotiation and due diligence process, right? They were looking at our code. This should have been a lot faster, but it just took this long with schedules and lawyers and, you know, lawyers. And you had enough money to like even go through this process on your side? Yeah. I mean, the, fortunately, the lawyers were like, hey, you could pay us when you when the deal closes. Oh, wow. Had the deal okay. not closed, I don't know what would have happened. Yeah. But those nine months or however long it was, for the first little while, it's not really legal intensive. It's the yeah. last little bit that becomes a nightmare with the red lining and the deal terms and the, this, you know, liability coverage and, you know, whatever. Yeah. The carve outs, the tech, this, the, you know, however you structure the deal with the tax guy, right? All that stuff. I think we spent probably 70 grand on lawyers. Just to get there. Deal. Yeah. Wow. Maybe, maybe a little less than that. Um, and then <laughs> so uneventfully one day I'm sitting like just before Christmas at my aunt's house in the fan, in the dining room with no fanfare. There's no one around. It's just me with a stupid Rudolph headband on. And I hit the DocuSign and that was it. And it was done. <laughs> <laughs> and none of my cousins gave a shit or knew, not that they didn't give a shit. They had no idea what it was, what had yeah. just happened. And we celebrated with like Domino's pizza. Like <laughs> we had Domino's at, in Canada with my cousins. And I was like, great. I did it. Like it was a weird I'm and it was, so and it was, you don't need to say the amount, but it was a million dollar exit, multi million yeah. dollar exit. Yeah, multi million dollar exit. And again, you all you should have stopped twice, maybe even three should've times. Stopped. I should have stopped before I started. I had no That's business right. being in this. <laughs> uh, it was it was clearly only grit. Like that was the only thing that held us on. Was just like I was not willing to not get to the exit. Right, right. You just didn't. I, I I relate to that. I mean, that's that's how I learned Bubble too. Is I my startup was failing, we ran out of money. I needed to learn how to build, yep. and I didn't want to accept failure. And so I kind of was pushed off the ledge, and I made it made it out, but not as good as you. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we got lucky. I think you know the right time at the right place with a lot of work, and I don't know. It's just been a long. It was a long time. I mean, you know, it's it's those moments like you. You'll probably remember that moment the rest of your life. You're at, at your aunt's house with your cousins. You signed this multi-million dollar thankfully. deal, <laughs> right? What's up? I have a th I have a photo of it. Thankfully, in case I, I need yeah, to you'll it. remember it for the rest of your life. And it's like those moments like really hit us the hardest, right? Of just like, um, I remember when I got my first movie that I ever worked on in the theaters. It was in California, and that was like my my dream. And I yeah. went to the theater, but I had no one to go with. I was all alone in California. And so I yeah. actually experienced this moment of seeing my movie in the theater and I was all alone. Yeah. And that was kind of like a moment that I will always have just kind of like you have just like, 
we have this success right here, but we don't have anyone to share it with. Um, and it kind of takes away from that moment. Yeah. Yeah. In, in that void, uh, you know, like in the community on Twitter had, I wasn't very much on Twitter at the time. Yeah. Had I, um, had a community there. Hey, we sold the company. Like maybe we would have gotten more fanfare. Yeah. But we got, uh, basically nothing like uh, lawyers well, were saying you were pretty quiet about it too like you could have reached out to bubble and say hey i just built sold this company half built on yeah. bubble they would have done something yeah at this point i was just like happy to be done i didn't yeah. know what was coming next i was about to start work at the company like a week later okay uh or two weeks later and i was just like great well for the moment i don't own this technology and my start date hasn't happened like yeah i can't do anything <laughs> there's yeah. nothing i can do and it was like, that's the thing I was so excited about. Yeah. Uh, and so you had to continue on helping with the other company yeah, that yeah, bought exactly. you for what, a year? Uh, I stayed on for six, uh, seven, eight months. Yeah. Was it in your contract to stay on six months or whatever? It, I didn't have to. I got a bonus. Okay. If I stayed for six months. Okay. So I got the bonus and then I left. Okay. That makes um, sense. I don't know. I think I regret it. Leaving. Uh, leaving. Um, Interesting. Because then what happened next wasn't so great as well. Another reason to quit and give up. Um, but, you know, life happens. Yeah. I didn't know all that. Yeah. Startups are for the faint of heart. Not I didn't even know ads on top were on top. I thought you were just doing billboards. <laughs> no, no, no. They started ads. It was so literal. Ads on top. Yeah. yeah. And then you yeah. ended up not doing hardware at all. It was just software and good geofencing and the, all the everything behind the software to allow people to really programmatically do advertising. Yeah, exactly. The yeah. we were geofenced everything, but geofencing didn't really make sense with a sign that didn't move. Right. Right. Like you could geofence it, like get everything in Los Angeles, but right. in the whole ad stack, we were on the supply side, not the demand side. On the demand side, yeah. if you're buying across many billboards at once, having a geofence is great. I could circle 10 billboards and change the ads. Yeah. But it turns out that's not actually how the out of home work market buys ads. Like they don't yeah. really make content that's super geofence. Yeah. Like, you know, we would pitch, hey, and this is probably non like not very <laughs> this detail of the out of home industry isn't that interesting, but we would pitch like, hey, we could when a car drives down a main area where all the bars are, we should change the ad to like vodka. Sure. Right. And then when it's near a Starbucks, it makes a lot of sense. Let's get Dunkin' Donuts to advertise. Yeah. Right. But that's just not how people bought ads. Yeah. Like, and we thought that's how they should. Yeah. Whether or not they should, it's not how they do it. And so yeah. it just like no one ever used any of these features that we had. The whole premise of the company was to do super targeted advertising. We could change it by the gender of the person sitting in front of the screen or the temperature. Oh, yeah. if it's raining and put an umbrella. If yeah. it's hot out, use a cold drink. If it's cold yeah. out, use a hot drink. Like, yeah. You know, we could even tie into like a POS. Oh, you aren't selling so many bagels today. Let's put some ads out for bagels, right? Yeah. Like, you know, it could be super dynamic, but that's not how anyone bought. They bought months in advance yeah. and they wanted one ad to rotate one every six times. That's what they weren't expecting. Well, that's also what they were used to, you know, like that's, right. that's what everyone else did. And so yeah. that's what they were used to buying like that. Yeah, and we weren't selling the ads. We sold the software to the company right. who sold the ads, right. and they and didn't want to change. Yeah. Right? If we owned the inventory, that's what we would pitch. Yeah. But we couldn't control that message. Yeah. And so we kept re simplifying and simplifying and simplifying the software to do yeah. just what it needed to do, not what I thought they should do or I wanted them to do. Yeah, um, Yeah, just enough. Well... I'm exhausted that was, telling that story. <laughs> that was a tremendous story. You're now <laughs> building another company. Now Maybe on another pod, we'll talk about that yeah, at another right time. Right. Yeah. Um, but, Jeez. you know, man, I think that's all, how all the best entrepreneurs are made is they should have given up many times. Yeah. And 
the, and everything's kind of telling us not to give up, right? But some reason you stuck around. Um, and in this case, it really worked out for you. It really did. Yeah. If nothing else, I had learned bubble. So Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I quite frankly, like I, I stuck around with it far too long than I should have. Um, and I didn't get quite the reward. I didn't get to, the, anything to make it worth it. And it just yeah. ended up being like a year or two of opp opportunity costs that I lost. But I still got the experience and the learning of it all, which was helpful. But yeah. like, you know, it's I think it's an important thing to like no one to quit, no one not to quit. But at the same time, do you ever know when? Like, it's it's really hard. It's I, that's why people invest in founders and they invest in, you know, like, you, do they have the grit to stick with it when time gets tough? Because yeah. it's not always going to work the first time or even the second time. But if you hang with it long enough, maybe it eventually will. You'll probably find something if you stick with it. And that's why I, you know, like living through that experience, I like the idea of having some investment to rely on, right? You yeah. get a, maybe a little salary, get a little bit more likely to succeed than yeah. if you don't have any savings or you don't want to put all your savings in, then you can't, you can't, yeah. get, you can't stay long enough. Yeah. I mean, one of my first business lessons in life is like, I was running a party bus in college, right? Um, and every Friday night, I had deals with all the clubs and everything. We'd pick them up in a limo bus and bring them to clubs. Uh, and yeah. they would get I, all that kind of stuff. But I couldn't keep it alive long enough to actually see it was success. Like everyone's like, yeah, I'm I'm signed up already. Like, but I couldn't afford to stay alive long enough to actually see anything of it. And I, yeah. you know, eventually it was nothing because I just couldn't stay alive long enough, you yeah. know? And it's like, you need to be able to be there for a year or two or like, cause things take time. It, it yeah, takes yeah, a while definitely. to build these things. Yeah. When you're the new guy, no one wants to talk, not no one. Lots of people don't want to talk to you because you're new. No one knows if you're going to stick around. Like everyone yeah, and they just don't even know of you world, yet. You know, if yeah, they do everyone find in the working they... world has already seen a dozen other startups come and go. Yeah. Right. And so they don't want, even though you haven't seen any of them, Right. right, they don't want to rely on a startup, and then they disappear in six months. Yeah, so you have to last longer than average before you can actually get a meeting with these folks. Which, which is one of the reasons why, like, if you're starting something like serious, like this is gonna be a multi-year thing. Like, it's gonna be two, three, five years. Of yeah, your I, life. I know like, I'm in this for five years. Yeah. This is gonna be the next five years. Yeah, and, and that's honestly that's. That's one of the reasons why I haven't started anything like seriously, because I don't, I don't want to do that anymore. Like I, I went through that route. I'm finally, I literally think this is the last month of paying off the business debt from closing this business two years ago, right? Wow. Like I'm just about to get out of this business. I'm feeling really good about it. Yeah. I'm still, I'm scared of it. I'm like, that's, it's a hard journey. Yeah. Yeah. Fortunately, like if we had to shut down, we would like, we wouldn't have had to pay anything back yeah there was nothing yeah i well, would not use debt debt is uh bad for first-time founders unless yeah, you have I, a cash flowing business i would not. i i use debt and that, that's why i'm just paying it off now yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> we ran out of angel funds and then we turned to credit cards and yeah. that was not a good experience yeah so yeah that's that's tough that one's hard Lessons learned. Lessons uh, learned. Fantastic story. Uh, we have another one for you next week. Uh, so until then, David. See you next week in no code. See you next week in no code, guys. <laughs>